you. Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you could be with us on this wonderful Sunday morning. We're excited. We're going to uh, get everybody to jump on here just a little bit. we got a wonderful message set up for today. I believe it's really, really going to bless you. So wherever you are traveling, going down the road, trying to compete in the Western world, doing your chores, all the above, we'd love to minister to you. You can just turn off the, the video part of this message and listen to the audio. So we're going to get started here in just a second. Let me see if I can pull this up on our monitor. If you don't mind, take a minute and share this with others. We're excited. There seems to be a little delay in my office here. So glad you could be with us. Everybody's jumping on. Try to go live here. Make sure we're in the right place. Hope you had a great week. We've got a lot of family and friends on here that have been following. Here. Make sure that we can get in this. There it is. Yeah, I've just got on. Uh, All right, so we're I... going live on here. Can't really see how many's on here. Let me know uh, if you can hear the audio here in just a second. So we've got a few folks on here. It's got the live up in the in the corner. All right. Well, we'll give everybody just a second to get on. Can you see who's on in just a second? Because, okay, there we go. We got a few folks jumping on here this morning. Glad you could be with us. We're going to get ready to get started here in a second. There we go. I don't know what that time delay is about, but technical stuff is interesting at best. So Torrential rains. We'll take a few minutes here to get everybody on. Let me know, can you hear the audio okay in your side of it? We'll get a thumbs up this morning. All right, some of you jumping on here. I'm actually watching the same thing that you're watching as well. So that'll be good. Let me go ahead and turn this down. we get ready to get started in the Word of God this morning. There we go. There's Leslie. All right, good morning, Miss Leslie. Angel is setting us up. Let me go ahead and shut off some of these windows. They're gonna be a distraction. We don't want that. Glad we could come to you this morning. A few folks on here. Let me uh, go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and shut some of these other ones down. We've got a powerful message this morning, so we are excited you could be with us. Let me go ahead. Brad, good morning. Leslie, everybody's got some audio is fine. Wonderful. Glad you guys could be with us. There'll be some more jumping on here as we get ready to get started. Thank you, Angel. As always, my wife does a good job. She's behind the scenes, but not with me. She helps me a lot. Travis, good morning. Okay. Well, as we get ready to get on, I see some folks jumping on. I'm excited for what God is going to minister to us on today. It's been one of those uh, messages that I know will truly help us. So again, if you're jumping on right now, we're going to try to stay punctual. And uh, thank you all so much for sharing and for commenting. And I really just use this as a monitor. I interact with you guys after the broadcast is done. So having said that, we're excited that all of you are in here. I know others will be jumping on a little bit. Sometimes the chores take a little longer or who knows where we're traveling to. So anyway, good morning. My name is Scott Mendes. I'm the executive director and founder of Western Harvest Ministries. We are a word-based teaching outreach ministry, evangelizing throughout the nation. So. Uh, really excited that you could be with us. Um, as you know, as a Bible teaching ministry, we're going to have uh, a lot of scriptures. Just ask that you write them down, meditate on them throughout the week. I know that God will bless you as you study the Word of God. And that's what we want to do is to help you to ride on course. So having said that, I want to tell you a little bit about our partners. Um, I partner nationally with our dear friends at USA Yo. Dot org. Please go to their website. You'll see all of our speakers and teachers, administration. You can click on my profile. And in fact, if you want me to come and to speak through your program and your outreach, just simply fill out a form and let us know how we could get you into the schedule of what's coming up. As you know, some things are opening up, and we are really going to have a wonderful summer and a late spring here with a lot of outreach ministries. We may be coming to you on this telecast from other areas outside 
of the office here at Weatherford, Texas, where I'm coming to you from uh, this morning. If you're ever in the area, please stop in. We'd love to see you. As many of you know, we produce many different outreaches and videos of our bull riding league, cowboy movies, and uh, audio teachings of testimony and things to help you grow. That is our heart, is to get the Word of God into your life so that God and you can do some incredible things. So, having said that, it's been another crazy week that we've all lived through. It has just absolutely been pouring down here in Texas, so we're believing God that it'll dry out. We're thankful for the rain and the livestock industry, all the things that we have to do here in the ranching uh, side of things. So, having said that, I want to pray with you guys this morning. We've had some incredible... Um, losses, some devastating things going on in our world. We live in perilous times. We live in challenging times. And it's all the more that we get the Word of God down in our heart and build the foundation of our beliefs so that we can detect and defend ourselves from the things of the world. Uh, again, check out our partner's website. We also work through the FCA, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Cowboy Chapters. We go and speak at uh, various groups and universities and high school as the Lord allows. We bring our mechanical bull in. We'd love to work with you, so please just continue to correspond with our ministry, and we'll engage and be there for you. Thank you for all your prayers and support. Let's go before the Lord, because as you know, we have time really goes fast in these broadcasts. So let's stand in agreement this morning, and then we'll teach the Word of God, and at the end we'll close out and give you an opportunity uh, to engage the Word of God as well. So let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning on this beautiful spring day, the 1st of May, Father. We lift up your Word. We lift up the needs of all of our partners, Father. We stand in agreement right now that where two or three shall agree as touching anything on this earth, it shall be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And so, Father, we ask that you would go over the needs of all of our partners, our first-time viewers, people watching this, Father God, for the first time, and bless them, Father. Be with them and to help them through their struggles and challenges of life. Father, we pray for healing where healing is needed. We pray for a financial breakthrough where a financial miracle is needed, Father God. And Lord, more importantly, we pray that we can be more conformed into the image of your Son, Jesus. We thank Him for dying on the cross for our sins as we come into that revelation of who we are in you, Father. Our lives are transformed. And that's what riding on course is all about today, is that we seek you and we spend time in your presence, that you would change our hearts, our minds, and our spirits, Father, to be more like you. We thank you, Father, for being our example and for loving us and for ruling and reigning over this world. Help us to see ourselves as you see us today through your word. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, Amen and amen. Praise God. When we leave our hat on, we know a lot of folks may be kind of uh, flipping through the channels and will see us here. So I'm excited. Many of you that are watching this and know how we teach, I want to I read from a foundational scripture this morning. And I want to um, encourage you in your faith and the reading of God's Word. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Romans chapter 8. As you know, I like to come to you every week with something that is relative that can you can apply in your life and your family to help you to grow spiritually. And as this week as I was reading, the Lord took me back to some things that when I was rodeoing, going up and down the road as a rodeo cowboy, uh, many of you know we have an outreach. It's a bull riding league called and training camps called Conquering the Beast. I believe with all my heart what we're going to talk about this morning will help you to conquer the beast in your life, whatever that may be. You have to recognize that you're in a battle. You have to recognize and call out that thing that stands between you and your relationship with God. If you'll do that, God is faithful and just to perform his word over your life. So anybody that's been around ministry uh, knows that the Roman roads is incredible. This is Paul's writing, and as he's writing to us, he's helping us to discern what is spiritual and what is flesh. So this morning, my message is, I want to talk to you about one of the words that comes out of this passage of Scripture, and it's called carnality. What does that mean? What is the result if we are carnal in our relationship, and how can we overcome 
our carnality. So we're going we're gonna to define it in just a moment, but we're going to read a passage of Scripture. Now, I'm going to uh, pull from other translations in a moment, but Romans chapter 8 is going to be the foundational Scripture, and I want to read verses 5 through 9. So I'm excited that you're with us this morning. And we prayed over the Word of God. We believe that His presence is in this office and coming to you today through this telecast. So let's go ahead and read Romans 8, 5, and then I'll tell you the title of today's message, and we'll break it down to where we can understand it. Amen? Never speaking over somebody's head and never watering down the message of God's Word, but reading it directly from His passages speaking to us. Romans 8, 5 says this, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can, nor can be. So then... Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does have the Spirit of Christ, uh, does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So we can see here that Paul has used the term carnal. For the carnal mind is enmity against God. And if we are in a spiritual mind, we have life and peace. So I know that if you're watching this broadcast, taking your valuable time, your free will to join us today, that you want to grow spiritually. And I want to just help to teach on some things that God dealt with me when I was going down the road. And he helped me to understand what were my priorities, what were my beliefs, and who was I serving, and to discern the reality of the things that I was ensnared and I was entrapped in. So we want to break down the problem of carnality. That is the title of today's message. So as we read this, I'm going to read from another translation in a moment. In fact, I just left it set this week as I was pulling these scriptures out to read to you. But I want to break down. You see, our English word carnal comes from the Latin word carnis, which if you break that down, it means flesh or even meat. And so as we look at that, we see, however, the application has usually come to a metaphorical meaning referring to attitude rather than literal. It is defined and it is mean. It means pertaining to the flesh or worldly appetites or desires rather than the godly or uh, spiritual desire. So let me just say this to help us because sometimes we get caught up in different translations and different definitions. When a man doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior, the one that died on his cross and shed his innocent blood for you, we are no more different than a wild animal in the jungle that you see on the Discovery Channel. Why is that? Because we are born into a sinful flesh. This suit, as we know, is our human body. It has its own appetite. It has its own desires. It has our own lust. It has our own fears. And through this teaching, I want to help us to, to realize some of the things that may have been tripping you up. Because if you don't know what you're fighting against, you're buffeting the air. You're fighting the wind. And so as we see this, we're going to understand that there is a... There is a flesh, let me go ahead, let me talk about the definition again. It is defined and means pertaining to the fleshly or worldly appetites rather than the godly and spiritual desires. You see, if you think that you're doing things for God and you're going after your own lust and your own appetites, you're going to be double-minded. And God's going to call you on that at some point. He's going to bring you into the family and then you're going to go through a season of growing spiritually with him. We hope, because that's our goal, to be more conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So, from the Word of God, we find in the Scriptures, so we need to dwell on the meaning of that and to understand what God's Word is talking about when He's talking about flesh, when He's talking about carnality, and to know the difference and to talk about being in the Spirit. So, I read this opening passage of Scripture today, our opening text, Romans 8, 
verses 5 through 9. Now what I did is I went over and I pulled out another translation. It's called The Passion. It reads a little bit different. It gives us some more insight and it's a little softer. Listen to this. I'm going to read the same passage of scripture again to help us. Romans 5 through 9 in The Passion says this. Those who are motivated by the flesh only pursue what benefits themselves. But those who live by the impulses of the Holy Spirit are motivated to pursue spiritual realities. For the sense and the reason of the flesh is death. But the mindset controlled by the Spirit finds life and peace. See, that's why I want to minister on this Romans 8 today. Because I believe with all my heart that we are all looking for life and peace. But sometimes we feel like we're trapped in spiritual death. We're not growing spiritually, and we have to go back and understand what is our mindset. Are we doing the things that we want to do, being led astray by the media, by the culture in which we live in, and they're controlling us, and we don't even know that. And so Paul is telling us right here that to have life and peace, we have to have a mindset controlled by the spiritual things of God. Now let me read verse 7. In fact, the mindset focused on the flesh fights God's plan and refuses to submit to his directions because it cannot. So this is what this message is tonight. Uh, today is going to talk about the problem of our carnality. And, you, and if you will stick with me through this teaching today, you're going to see that there are times that the enemy and even your own flesh and even the senses and the, and the cultures that we live in has pulled us astray and we get defeated because we're trying to please God, but we're caught in our own flesh. And some doctrines and some religions will leave you right there, and they won't teach you how to come out from up underneath that and be free. The truth that you and I know, the truth of God's Word, will make you free. But it's not good enough to hear it. You have to have application and not deceive yourself. So let's go a little farther. In verse 8, it says, For no, one, uh, for a matter how, uh, for no matter how hard... They try, God finds no pleasure with those who are controlled by the flesh. But when the Spirit of Christ empowers your life, you are not dominated by the flesh, but by the Spirit. And if you are not joined to the Spirit of the Anointed One, which simply in this translation means Jesus, if you are not controlled by that Spirit, you are not of Him. Now Paul doesn't play around. There's no gray area. And I want to come to us today to challenge us, just like I did when I was going down the road rodeoing. The Lord was ministering to me, and He was showing me, am I controlled by death and being carnally minded, or was I spiritually minded, seeking the things which are above, putting our mindset on those things? Because we see very clearly there is a problem with our carnality. The appetites of our flesh, God is not pleased with that. In fact, He says, you are not even His. We have to be controlled under the submission and the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go on and let's answer some of these questions today. There is a total emphasis, as we see in verses 5, 8, and 9 of what we read. We read out of the New King James, my Bible. We also pulled it from the Passion Translation, which gives a few key words that are a little softer that I totally love. So we want to make sure that we belong to God not only to be answering an altar call and say, I'm a Christian because I go to church, but growing spiritually. And the wedge that may be standing between your victory and your breakthrough and your relationship with God could, in fact, just be our own carnality. It could be that we've been manipulated and we're following the things of the world. So what does it mean to be carnal? We're going to answer that this morning. How does being carnal show itself in our lives? See, sometimes there's a cause and effect, and that's what the enemy, exactly what, what he wants to do is he wants to deceive you to think that you're living for God when in fact, in reality, you're not even growing spiritually. And this carnality is what I'm addressing today as Paul wrote in Romans 8. So how does carnality show itself in our life? What can be done to avoid being carnally minded? Let's look at a couple things. Basically, it means to be under control of the flesh. If you'll turn back one chapter to Romans chapter 7, we want to read verses 14 through 18. 
So what does it mean to be controlled by the flesh? Again, I want to read this from the Passion. Maybe a little different of what you're reading in your Bible. Maybe you have a King James. Maybe you have an NIV. God and you can deal that out. There are a lot of different debates on different translations. I'm a teacher, so if you came into my office, you'd see a library wall full of different translations. The Amplified, the Passion. And every week that I study these messages and I come to you, I pull from them so that one word might resonate down in your spiritual man to help you to be free in your walk with Christ. Listen to this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Romans 7, 14 through 18. For we know that the law is divinely inspired and comes from the spiritual realm. But I am a human being of flesh and trafficked as a slave under sin's authority. See, Paul says that when you're operating in sin, you're being trafficked. You're being, uh, you're being, you're under that authority. And let's read verse 15. He says, I, it, I am a mystery to myself, for I want to do what is right, but I end up doing what my moral instincts condemn. See, Paul is saying every time I get on that road and I'm growing with Christ, I'm going to church, I'm reading the Word of God, I'm trying to do right, I revert back to sin in my life. And it takes authority over me and it misleads me in the belief system. It misleads me in my thought pattern and my mindset changes and it pulls me back into my wicked ways. And so he says my moral instincts are condemned. But if my behavior, verse 16, but if my behavior is not in line with my desires, my, my conscience still confirms the excellence of the law. So his flesh is telling him to do one thing, but the law of God's grace and the word of God is telling him the excellence of the law in his mind is telling him to do something different. Verse 17, and now I realize that it is my humanity uh, now I realize that it is uh, no longer my true self doing it, but the unwelcoming intrusion of sin in my humanity. See, that's the thing is once we become a Christian, the old man is dead, crucified, buried, resurrected. And if you continue to not change your mind and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, you're always going to have this lure, this, this uh, connection to humanity. But let's go on. Verse 18 says this. For I know that nothing good lives within my flesh and my fallen humanity. The longings to do what is right are within me. So he has a desire. The Holy Spirit, God is drawing him in there. He wants to do right and it's within him. But willpower is not enough to accomplish it. You see, that's what's wrong with all the positive thinking and the sloppy grace and all this. I can pull myself up by the bootstrap. And I can have my goals, and I can be a better self. These things have infiltrated the Word of God and our church services today. So it is very important that we go back to the teachings of Christ. And so understand that willpower is not enough. Paul is saying that. And so as we read in Romans 7, he wanted to do right, and the desire was there, but his flesh and his mindset of not being renewed to the Scriptures was pulling him back like a magnet. Maybe you can relate to me today where you're at in the situations you find yourself in. Amen? So, basically, the carnality is the flesh, and it has its own desires. But as Christians, we are called to a new desire and a new mindset. Thus, those who are carnal devote their minds and life to the things of the flesh. <clears throat> Excuse me, we had a lot of allergies this week with the rain and everything in Texas. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3. I want to talk to you about God's power raised us from the dead. Again, this is a wonderful translation that I'm reading to you from today called The Passion. Ephesians 2, 1 and 3. And His fullness fills you, even, even though you were once like a corpse, dead in your sins and your offenses. It wasn't that long ago that you lived and the religion, customs, and values of the world. See, I'm here to tell you today that the world has a plan for you and I. But if we are Christians maturely, spiritually developed, we are not going to allow that to happen. We're going to recognize it, and we're going to come out from among them and be separate. 
And we're going to be victorious because when our Christ and our Lord returns, we're going to be caught up in the twinkling of an eye and we're going to be standing in victory with him. So religion, customs, and values of the world, obeying the dark ruler of the earthly realm. Who is that? Satan, the deceiver, the accuser, the liar, the father of all lies. He's trying to deceive believers, even in the realm of the earth, who fill the atmosphere with his authority. See, you may not understand it, but until you come under the authority and a relationship and a covenant with God, you're in the world. And there is a prince of the air through the media. There is a devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And you may think that you're walking with God and you're growing, you're trying to do these things, but yet your heart has not had that transformation, the renewing of the mind. You've confessed Jesus as Lord. You've gone into church, but you continue to live in the customs of the world. And that is where Satan has the authority who works diligently in the hearts of those who are disobedient to the truth of God's word. This is Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3. God's power raised us from the dead. So we see the corruption that is in us from birth expresses through the deeds and the desires of the self-life. That's why I'm reading from this translation, the self-life. How much time do you and I put into self and our own desires. We have dreams. We have aspirations. Well, when I became a Christian, all those self-dreams went out the window. And I've had a new desire inside of me to be Christ-like, to walk in love, to have forgiveness of sins, to be a vessel that God could use in his army, to be a role model. And so self went out the window. Servant came in. And these things that have helped me in my life and my walk in our ministry, we want to get those injected into you to think about what are you serving? What are your gods? What, is, what are you putting focus on? Let's read the rest of this verse in, at the end of 3. It says, We live by whatever natural cravings and thoughts our mind dictated, living as rebellious children subject to God's wrath like everyone else. See, there's a wide gate. And there's a narrow gate. And God said he wants us to go through the narrow gate, which leads to life, peace, joy, and victory. If you're just going with the flow, you're just going to church thinking that you're a Christian, never ever meditating on the Word of God, never praying, never engaging the gospel truth, then you're going to be deceived. So we got to get rid of this self, this carnality. The problem with that is, is it leads to death. The life and peace that you're looking for comes from being spiritually minded, pulling those things down from heaven, even in even in the place of which where we live today. So they, de they devote their minds to the things of flesh. I'm asking us today to put our mind on a spiritual mind, which will help us to grow. It is the opposite of being spiritually minded. We're talking about the meaning of carnality. We see Paul writing about it. We see that he's walking in the spirit, but all of a sudden sin shows back up. Maybe it's a phone call from an old boyfriend or girlfriend or a divorce situation or a broken situation or a business partner. They, they, they ring up, they, you see it, and all of a sudden you're, you're, you're pulled back into that situation where you get angry, you get bitter, you get mad. It recalls you to think about a fit of carnality. God says, bring those things to me. Leave them at the foot of the altar. Pray over them. Ask forgiveness. So let's look right now at the opposite of being spiritually minded. Let's look at Philippians 3, verses 16 through 21. I'm going to read really fast for time purposes. We're getting halfway into this message. But Philippians 3, verses 16 through 21 is the opposite of being spiritually minded. Let's read this. I'm going to read really quickly. It's hard not to stop and teach along the way. But verse 16 of Philippians 3 says this, And let us all advance together to reach this victory prize, following one path with one passion. There's one way to heaven, there's one Jesus, and there's one way that he calls all of us to come into him. So listen to this, verse 17. My beloved friends, imitate my walk with God and follow all of those who walk according to the way of life and who have modeled this before you. Paul is saying you got to have new friends. you got to have new relationships. Those that are spiritually minded. You cannot hang out with turkeys and expect to fly and soar with eagles. So that deals into our character. Let's go on. So he's saying 
uh, modify this, imitate him. Verse 18, for there are many who live by different standards. As I have warned you many times, Paul is saying, be careful of who you hang around. Bad company corrupts good character. I remember that. I loved my buddies that I was partying with, but sometimes I had to say, no, I need to be here. I need to spend time with God. I need to be in his word. There was a desire that was pulling me to more reading of the word of God. Didn't mean that I was better than anybody. It just meant that I wanted to be used of God. I had to grow. I had a lot of hardness for my childhood from the things that I saw and experienced in the world. And I'm asking you today, whatever you've experienced, whatever you've been with or without, we have to let go of those things and press into our relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul says, I've warmed you many times. Reading from Philippians 3. <clears throat> um, I weep and I write with those words. And, and uh, there are enemies of the cross and of the anointed one. Doom awaits. So if you want to hang out in that side of the street, in the cultural and the things of the world, and just out there in the parties and all the running around, in the appetites of the flesh, there is a doom that is a weight that awaits them. And that is what I'm talking about to help us today to come out from under that. Their God has possessed them and made them mute. See, that's what's happening in the world today. We're not standing up for what we believe in, and so we're muted. We're silenced in our faith and in our doctrine. <clears throat> they boast in their shameful lifestyle, and their minds are in the dirt. But we are... A colony of heaven on earth and we are clinging tightly to our life giver the Lord Jesus Christ without Jesus there can be no life there is no light and that is what we have to do you're gonna have to sacrifice what has your relationship required you everybody gets saved under the fire insurance of the gospel <clears throat> Excuse me, I need to get a drink here. Everybody answers an altar call because they don't want to go to hell. How many people get saved because they love the Lord and they want to spend time with Him and they need Him? So He is the life giver um, who transformed our humble bodies and transfigured us into the identical likeness of His glorified body. And using His matchless power, he continually subdues everything to itself. These are powerful. Let me read one more. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It's under the caption, one with Christ in glory. Now again, we're talking about the opposite <coughs> Excuse me, of carnality. So we see this right here. Let me read this. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. See, religion takes you right up to the cross where Jesus is hanging. But a relationship will take you to that resurrection. And when we die to ourselves, there's a resurrection of a newness of life. And that was that is what Paul was saying. You've got to be spiritually minded. You have to have goals and an ambition and a passion to grow spiritually in your character. So Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. There is a way... That uh, we there that this is why we yearn from all that is above, for that's where Christ is seated and enthroned at the place of power. Christ did it. We're going to do it through Him, and we need to have that power as well. The honor and the authority is all in Jesus. So, uh, verse two: Yet feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm, and fill your thoughts with heaven, heavenly realities. And do this with the dis, uh, distinctions of the natural realm, not with the distinctions of the natural realm. So Paul is basically saying, when you're listening to the world of the music and going down memory lane, you can actually find a Christian group, praise and worship and rap and rock, that's giving, <coughs> excuse me, lyrics to the Lord. We can be renewed. We're not distracted by the system of the world, the secret societies, the false religions, the false doctrines, the denominations of men which nullify the works of God's word. 
I'm talking to you about exactly what the Lord has ministered to me over the years and the things that we must do to grow spiritually and conquer the beast in the realm of your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. <clears throat> I believe sometimes we are saved in our mind, but there's things in our body and our life that we need to heal. So let's move on. We talk clearly about carnality is the opposite of being spiritually minded. Let's talk about what is the results of carnality. These are some things that you can identify in your life, and if you see them, call it for what it is. We need to repent. We need to find new relationships. We need to fill our minds with heavenly realm instead of earthly realm. We need to quit listening to all these reports that are telling us where to go and what we should do. There's not one shot, one pill, one fix for your problems. It's called spending time in the presence of the anointed one, Jesus Christ, and coming to him. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. These are passages. I'll read them very quickly. A call to spiritual maturity. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I found it impossible to speak to you of those who are spiritually mature people. For you are still dominated by the mindset of the flesh. He's saying, I can't even talk to you about deep things of God. Why? Because we're still in a mindset of the flesh. And because you are immature infants in Christ, I have to nurse you and feed you with milk. Not with the solid food or more advanced teaching because you, were, you weren't ready for it. You see that? You have to grow step upon step. You get saved and then you grow. You don't just get saved and go back and put God's grace on you and say, I can live like hell and expect him to bless that and pull you out of your bondage? Absolutely not. God expects us to pull ourselves out by renewing our spiritual man to the things of God. Not meditating on the world and the evening news and the secret societies of this world, giving your oath, giving your love and your first affections to the things of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he says, because you weren't ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready for to be fed solid food. Verse 3, for you are living your life dominated by the mindset of the flesh. Ask yourself, is there any jealousy among you? Do you compare yourself with others? Do you quarrel like children and end up taking sides? If so, this proves that you are living your life centered on yourselves. Man, Paul was rebuking and admiration and fear of the Lord to the people of his time. We are coming forth today in this message saying, if you see these things in your life, we're living in carnality. You can't keep going to church and not grow spiritually and expecting God to save you. When the time comes and he returns, there's going to be an account of how you lived with the treasures, with the opportunities that Christ gave us. So we got to be ready for that. So is there any jealousy, comparing yourself, fighting like children, taking sides? This proves that you're centered on yourselves and, <clears throat> excuse me, dominated by the mindset of the flesh and behaving like unbelievers. Man, I'm telling you, I don't know how many people that I encounter in life that are church-going, good-hearted, good-meaning people, but they are acting like unbelievers. And we can't expect that God will do anything in our lives when we're dominated with a mindset of the flesh in our own wicked, perverted carnality. Now I'm reading these scriptures because they mean so much because they helped me when I became a Christian and I realized I need to grow. I see these things and recognize them in my life. I need to repent and turn 100 degrees the other way. Behaving like unbelievers, verse 4. For when you divided yourself up into groups, one group going with Paul, uh, the other group going with Apollos, you are acting like people without spirits, without the Spirit's influence, just like carnal animals in the kingdom of the jungle, going after whatever feels good, whatever looks good, whatever makes you think that people think more highly of yourself. These are indication of low insecurities. We can't carry the stuff over in the church. We come into the church broken. We come into the church repented. We come into church humble. If you come to church to just look good and show everybody that you have it all fixed and your life is without problems, 
you're, you're not being true to yourself. And the enemy loves that because that is deception. So let's go on. He says, and, and he's talking, you don't have the spirit of the influencers picking these different groups. Well, what about picking different denominations today? Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, Mormons, uh, Seven-day Advents. There's no more than what we're doing today. Don't be affiliated with some denomination. Be affiliated with the Word of God and be classified as a child of God growing spiritually. In order to do that, when you recognize carnality in the flesh and the habits and the likeness of it, you crucify it. You experience the same resurrection that Jesus did, but you got to die to self. And if you haven't ever died to self and you just got saved, you're a carnal Christian, defeated, already deceived. Hearing the word but not doing the word, you are deceived. Satan loves these kind of people. So we have to come out from under this. And believe me, I'm talking to myself as I preach with this boldness because it is an anointing of God. Another result is following the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. Stay with me today. I know we get a little long and there's a lot of passages. We're, we're going to wrap this up. We're talking about three areas. What does it mean to be carnal? What are the results of carnality? And then the last one is how do we overcome our carnality? Look at Galatians 5, 19 through 21. The Holy Spirit is our victory. So he says this from the Passion Translation. The believer of the self-life is obvious, or the behavior of the self-life is obvious. Now, if we have any of these things in our life, we are to call them out, we are to repent, and we are to have the Holy Spirit reveal them to us. And we are to confess them, we are to grow and go through and over them. God doesn't just pull us out. God is with us in the fire. God is with us in the lion's den. If you're there, it's okay. But you can't stay there. God loves you. And he says, I have a higher life up here. Even though you know about me, you're staying down here in the milk, in the immaturity. Because you're still driven by the things of the world. Listen to what he says. The behavior of the self-life is obvious. Sexual morality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God. Manipulating others. Hatreds of those who get in your way. Senseless argument. Resentment. When others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, being envious of the blessings of others, murderer, uncontrolled addiction, wild parties, and of all the similar behaviors. If you call yourself a child of God and any of these things are present in your heart, in your mind, in your thoughts, that is the flesh. That is carnality, and it is not okay to keep going to church and thinking that you're doing well, that God is going to give you grace, or that your positive thinking can overcome and bring you into victory. Absolutely not. If God came right back this moment and he judged our lives, we would be sent to hell. I had a defining moment when my friend was killed in front of my eyes writing, and I realized if that was me, I was doing this while thinking I was a Christian. And I realized I better conquer the beast in my soul more than the one that I was riding in the arena. And I'm challenging you this morning, brothers and sisters, to conquer the beast in your life. Don't allow carnality and a little bit of the world to trickle in. It will overtake you in time. It will immobilize you. It will shut up what you believe. Listen to what he says right at the very end, verse 21 of Galatians 5. He says, haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedoms, your free will that God gave you, if you're using that for these things that I just read, you will not inherit the realm of God or the kingdom of God is not available to you. Isn't it deception to walk around and think that you are a Christian, you're going to heaven, but you're living in the carnality of life, culture, religion? We must break those things. Call them what they are. Get into mentorship, discipleship. Get into the Word of God. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, to show you what you're meditating on and how much of that time is being used for things of the world. Amen. So you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God if you have any of these things. Murder, sexual morality, lustful thoughts, pornography, senseless arguments, quarrel, being angry, being bitter. As a Christian, we cannot do that. It should not be allowed to be taught in the pulpit, to be passive, 
in the things of God. We've got to aggressively come up from underneath these things, especially in the times that we live in, folks. Let's do better. Let's come out from under that. The ultimate result is passing away rather than living forever. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. I've got to speak up. I've only got another 10 minutes to read and to get these points across to us today. I know what the world has to offer. You do too. If you don't think there's anything wrong with your walk or that you can't grow, you can't do better, then stay where you're at. The problem is you could miss heaven. Your eternal destination depends on the choices that you make. <coughs> Amen. Let's listen to this. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. A warning to not love the world. And that's what this is. This is a warning to if you see carnality, you're operating by the flesh, rebuke it. Cast it down, put it under the authority of your feet, and be a Christian. A blood-bought child of God in all righteousness. It says in verse 15, don't settle for the affections of your heart on this world. Don't set your affection of your heart on this world. Um, or in loving the things of the world. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incapable, incompatible. So you can't love them both. You can't love God and love the world. For all that the world can offer us, the gratifications of our flesh, the allurement of the things of the world, and the obsession with status of importance, none of these things come from the Father, but from the world. That's what I'm saying, folks. If we recognize these things and we allow them to go unconfessed, unaddressed, they lay in there. The Bible says, do not let the wrath of God, your anger, do not go to sleep on your anger. Because if you do, you're giving Satan a foothold into your life. We can't allow that. You leave a little bit of that nonsense in your mind, in your heart, that pain from previous experience. We bring it all to the altar. We crucify it. We come up from underneath that. We don't use our free will <coughs> excuse me, for the things of the world. So the status of importance. None of these things come from the Father but from the world. Verse 17. The world and its desires are in the process of passing away. See, I'm telling you, Jesus is going to show up on the scene and he is going to set this stuff straight and we need to be aware of what's going on so that we can be with him. Those that are in the middle that are lukewarm, he's going to spit you out of his mouth. So it is vitally important that we take this to understanding. We're passing away. But those who love to do the will of God will live forever. So just as a recap, we talked about the carnality, the meaning of it, that it's the opposite to be spiritually minded. And what is the result of carnality? We don't grow spiritually. We have these things in our life and we need to not, they're enabling us from us developing our spiritual walk with God. Amen. So let's talk about how we overcome our carna, excuse me, our carnality. First, we must recognize and admit that there is a battle with the flesh. See, there's a spiritual you and then there's a fleshly you. And when you get those two confused, which is what this devil and the enemy tries to do, through all the things that you put in your mind, your eyes, your mouth, your hands, your heart, the senses of the flesh, when you allow that stuff in there, it takes up root. It's like a bad seed that has gotten planted in your life. And then if we don't uproot that, it spoils the whole harvest. <clears throat> so Matthew 26, 41 says it this way. Keep alert and pray. You'll be spared from the time of testing. Your spirit is willing but your flesh is weak. That's when Jesus was with the disciples and he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. They could not tarry with him for one hour. Their spirit man was willing, but their flesh was weak. Always deal in the realm of the supernatural, the spiritual side of the things of life. Don't let your eyes, we're not moved by what we see, we're moved by faith. So all these things are help us. So recognize there's a battle with the flesh and the flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. Next, we got to look at the things uh, that God has put in the way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I've got to read really quickly because I have two more passages and then we'll wrap it up. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. In this translation of the Passion is the way of escape. 
with all experiences, times, and testing which are normal for every human being. It's not a sin for you to be caught in these things and to recognize these things. It is a sin when you act upon them and you allow a negative thought to lead and orchestrate your life and who you're hanging around with and the business that you're running, expecting God to bless that. He sees and knows all things. You may as well come clean to him and give it to him. Because on the day that he returns, there's not going to be enough time to turn around. It's end of game. And what you've done is what you will give account for. So we need to make that right. Which is normal for every human being, the testing and the, and the times. But God will be faithful to you. He will screen and filter the severity, the nature, and the timing of every test and trial you face, uh, that you face. God sees where you're at. But he says, I'll give you a way of escape. And here it comes. Um, so that you can bear it. And each test is an opportunity to trust him more. For along with every trial, God has proved for you a way of escape that you bring you that he will bring you out of it victoriously. So the way of escape is to have dependency and total trust and commitment that God knows where you are. God said that if you draw close to me, he will draw close to you. That's a way of escape. But as long as you want to leave that wickedness and the carnality of your flesh and your walk and keep going to church, God will never deal with that. And then he'll ask you, what have you done? I gave you my word. I gave you those teachings. I gave you Paul's life as an example. I gave you Jesus' life as an example. To come out from under that. To be stronger. To recognize the signs and the times that we are in. So let's look at, under prayer, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. These are the weapons of our warfare to fight the flesh. Don't be pulled in different directions or worry about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with an overflowing gratitude. Tell Him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends uh, human understanding will guard your heart and guard your mind through Jesus Christ. This is a powerful passage of scripture on prayer. Come to God when you recognize there's carnality in your life. Don't just go to church and put on a church face. Don't just hang out in these bad situations expecting different results. The Holy Spirit is drawing us every day to help us to defend against sin in our life that brings shame, that brings guilt. So let's talk about how we, we talked about how we can use scripture and prayer to overcome the things of the flesh and to overcome carnality. Listen to 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 says this, God has transmitted his very substance into every scripture. It is God breathed. It is God ordained. When you read the word of God, it's just like Jesus sitting in your lap. You sitting in Jesus' lap. That's why we shouldn't allow it to sit on the coffee table collecting dust. We read the word of God. We put the seed of God's word in our heart. So we see God's transmission transmitted his very substance into every scripture. For it is God breathed. It, is, it, uh, it will empower you by its instruction and its correction. My question is, are you willing to be instructed and be corrected? Because if you listen to the world, we live in a generation that doesn't want to be taught, that doesn't want to be corrected, doesn't want to be rebuked. They know it all. They can go to Google. They can pull it up. They can read about it. Just reading about it doesn't know that you know how to do it in real life. This is a wicked and perverse, technologically advanced generation. But all that has done is pulled us away from the things of God. And we've got to get back to the elementary teachings of God, a prayer life, a confession of of unconfessed sin, of our carnality, to break that wickedness over our life and to come into spiritually minded things and grow. So it empowers us for instruction and correction, giving you the strength to take the right direction and to lead us into a deeper, uh, into the path of godliness. See, be corrected by God. Be corrected by the Spirit of God. Change your mind. Think about <clears throat> what would happen of all the time that you think about self and your self-centeredness 
in the things of the world and your goals and your aspiration, if you used one-tenth of that time to think about God, to think about heaven, to think about what it will be like to meet the heroes of faith, when we do that and we transform into that way of thinking, then we're going to produce that way of victory in our life. So let me finish that. Verse 17. Then you will be God's servant, fully mature, and perfectly prepared to fulfill any assignment that God gives you. I'm telling you today that God loves you, that His Spirit wants to draw closer to you. His Word needs to be placed into your heart because there's coming a day when we might not even be able to have our Bibles. They may try to reindoctrinate us, but go ahead because my mind is already clamped down with the Word of God and your mind should be clamped down with the Word of God. Because as a man thinketh, so goes he. So we allow all the wickedness of this culture, of this false religion, these false denominations, we are to come up from out from under those things. Call carnality, carnality, repent and get into spiritual things. So any assignment that God gave you, my notes are simply the Great Commission. That's the assignment that we have. Not simply about self and winning the world and being the greatest, the most popular, and manipulating and stealing and conniving your way to the top. Whatever you compromise to gain, you will ultimately lose. Amen? I'm telling you right now that we have to be aware. Satan's great, greatest weapon is man's ignorance of God's Word. Let me say that again. Satan's greatest weapon is man's ignorance of God's Word. So you want to be victorious in your life? Here it is. Read it. Study it. Meditate on it. And then all your ways, as God said to Joshua, shall be successful. Now I need to close. So we see we can use the scripture. We can use prayer. We have a way of escape through Jesus. Our carnality is a battle with the flesh. You can't be a carnal Christian. You can't go to church and not apply the things of God. So let's look at this conclusion of our scripture, and then I want to pray with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1 Peter 4, verses 1 through 2. Living in the grace of God. Since Christ, through, innocent, uh, through his innocent suffering in the flesh for you. See, Christ did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for the world. But if you think he just did it for the world and he didn't do, for, do it for you, then you'd be listening to Satan's lies. Don't be ignorant of the word of God. He did it for you. He did it for your heart. But he's not going to put the word in your heart. You have to do that. You have to put on the full armor of God to fight the wiles of the enemy, the fiery suggestions. So he suffered in the flesh for you and I. Now you also must be a prepared soldier God is saying we're in a battle on this earth, this fallen earth that Satan controls. See, I think you're deceived by thinking that God controls it and that he's just going to come and get us. No, we're going to be here until we prepare the bride, the church, for the coming of the Lord. And so be a prepared soldier, having this same mindset, 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 mindset. Hear that? Renewing your mind to the word and scriptures of God's word. For whoever has died in his body is done with death. So have you died to your old thoughts? Have you died to your old habits? Have you died to your own way of thinking? Are you ready for the salvation that God has given us? See, your character is the sum total of your habits. Your habits are formed and re repeated by, are formed by repeated decisions. You, you never make an unimportant decision because every decision is either a positive or a negative one. It is either building you up or breaking you down, breaking down your character. Amen? I just wanted to read those quotes because your decisions matter. Your carnality matters. You cannot be a carnal Christian. You cannot sit there under the teaching of a church that will not tell you how to grow spiritually and come in and entertain you. It's not about positive thinking. It's about a covenant. It's about a God that loves you to send his son to die for you. Let me finish uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 2. Having the same mindset for whoever died for you is dead, body is dead with sin. So live the rest of your earthly life no longer concerned with human desires, but consumed 
with the things that bring pleasure to God. Amen. We see that. We have to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death. The choice is yours and mine. Now before I pray with you, I want to read a powerful quote. Listen to this because as I pray with you, this is very important to close this teaching about carnality. You see, you will spend eternity in the condition in which you die. If you die in Christ, you'll spend eternity in Him. If you die outside of Christ, then you will spend eternity outside of Him. Then will be uh, there will be no second chance for rehabilitation or escape in route of hell. That is basically a quote from Luke 16. My questions to you and I today, are we carnal? We live in a physical body. We live in a world subject to the, to the culture that we live in. There is a pursuit of the world, the devil, political parties, denominations, religions, false doctrine, and it's trying to come into our life and to immobilize us from growing in our relationship with God. And I think it's wickedness. And I think that we need to rise up and revolt and have revival throughout this nation for America. And revival starts with individuals. It starts with your family. It starts with your community. And you need to be around like-minded people. And those that are desiring to come into the kingdom of God must pray this simple prayer. You will not inherit the kingdom of God unless you are reborn or born again. If what I've said to you about your carnality or if you've ever seen any of these appetites and desires of the flesh in your life renounce them call them out put them under your feet and get into a mindset of how much God loves you and that he sent his son to die for you will you pray with me today my time is out pray this prayer say dear Jesus forgive me of my sin I have been carnally lost carnally deceived I have been more caught in self than in servitude to you. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I ask your son Jesus to come into my heart. And I ask that I be filled with your Holy Spirit, which is the same spirit that raised mm -hmm. Jesus from the dead. And Father, as I renew my mind to your word and I crucify my flesh, I have heard today that I am a partaker in your resurrection. Help me to put on a new man, mind, heart, spirit, and put on heavenly things above earthly things. And my focus shall be upon you and you will guide my steps. I surrender to you. I love you. Thank you for forgiving me. And I ask you to use me in your kingdom and in your service for all the years to come should you tarry. Thank you, Jesus, for being my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Well, what a powerful message. I know we're a few minutes over. It is incredibly hard um, to stop some of these teachings. I'm not pointing the finger on anybody in their carnality. We live in the flesh, but the more that we live in the Spirit of God and allow the Holy Spirit to guide our life, we will grow. We will be victorious. And again, that is exactly what all these cowboy films are, all these teachings. If you would like to partner with us, simply go to westernharvestministries.com scottmendes.com follow us on social media thank you for sticking with me i see those that are sticking with me and i pray that this message will impact your life and again i challenge us all to ride on course with your lord until next week god loves you and we love you we'll see you down the road thank you bye-bye